Uh, we're excited to um, have this talk on um, what I think is a, a timely, um, relevant topic for a lot of folks right now. Um, so this is on uh, evidence-based strategies to address uh, social isolation and loneliness in people with psychosis spectrum disorders. Um, so before we start, I'll hand it off to Lola uh, to give some introductions. Um, so this is a, a joint talk between uh, MAPNET, uh, the Massachusetts Psychosis Network for Early Treatment, um, as well as the New England MHTDC. Um, so I'll hand it to Lola to give our MHTDC introduction. Thank you, Kelsey. Hi, this is Lola. I am the coordinator of the Harvard and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, site for the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. And now I'll just go ahead and review a few housekeeping items before we begin. So participant microphones have been muted at entry and you'll be able to unmute them during the discussion portion of the presentation. During the presentation, if you have any technical difficulties or even questions about the topic, please use the chat box. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing at a later time on the MHTTC and MapNet websites. To reach us after the webinar, you can email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. Next slide, please. This slide provides a description of our disclaimers for MHGTC. Next slide, please. The MHGTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. That language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, inviting to per individuals participating in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear and understandable, and lastly, consistent with our actions, policies, and products. And with that, it is my pleasure to hand it over to Kelsey for introductions. Sure, thank you. And yeah, thank you everyone for uh, introducing yourself in the chat. It's really uh, great to see people uh, really from all over joining us today. Um, so by way of brief introduction, uh, we have Dr. Jasmine Moat with us today. Uh, so she's a licensed clinical psychologist and a research assistant professor at Boston University. Um, so she received a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of California, Berkeley, and has over 10 years of experience working with clients across the psychosis spectrum. Uh, so currently her research is focused on understanding and addressing social and emotional difficulties of people living with serious mental illness. Uh, so I know this is a, a topic that uh, is very relevant for a lot of our teams here in Massachusetts. Um, and I think, you know, anecdotally, uh, it becomes especially relevant uh, right now around the holidays and um, when it's darker and colder uh, here in New England. I'm not sure about other places in the country. But um, so it, with that, very excited to hear um, a little bit uh, about this topic and also how we can think about addressing it in treatment. So uh, with that, Jasmine, I'll, I'll give it to you. Hey, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. So um, thank you, Kelsey, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm just gonna do a quite a little bit of a fuller like introduction about me and my past. And so, like she said, I have a PhD in clinical psychology from UC Berkeley, where I studied under Anne Kring, understanding the emotional and social difficulties of people with schizophrenia, as well as doing some um, treatment intervention development for people with bipolar disorder. I did my clinical internship at Rutgers University Behavioral Healthcare, where I was lucky enough to be part of developing um, the first, first episode coordinated care specialty clinic um, within Central New Jersey under the supervision of Dr. Stephen Silverstein. I've done some postdoctoral fellowships, um, one at the Bedford VA, where I was working mostly with veterans with PTSD, as well as within um, the local Cedar Clinic, um, doing clinical work with families and young adults at clinical high risk services. Now, um, as Kelsey said, I'm a research assistant professor at Boston University, and I'm also a part-time private practice therapist at Cambridge Psychology Group. And so I still um, do a lot of clinical work with people with psychosis, but now also focusing on adults going through transitions, um, particularly um, people um, who are pregnant or um, in the postpartum period. Um, so kind of trying to balance that research and clinical life, as I'm sure many of you um, know well, but just the breadth of my experiences is really focused on the lifespan of people with psychosis spectrum disorders from clinical high risk to first episode through working with adults um, who are chronically ill with psychotic disorders. 
Now, um, uh, as part of the approach motivation and participation lab, I just wanted to give kind of a brief overview of the type of research we do. So um, we're really interested in understanding the mechanisms of loneliness and social connection and mental health. We use um, ecological momentary assessment or experience sampling, a methodology that allows us to assess momentary experiences of the social lives of people both with and without serious mental illness. We do some work on mobile-based interventions to address social motivation and social skills for people with schizophrenia. And then I've also been part of projects assessing the efficacy of small businesses dedicated to promoting social connection in the community. So I might talk about some of this work throughout today, um, but just a little shout out to um, our lab um, with the principal investigator, Van Fulford. So, um, you know, I know the audience I'm talking to, everyone here is a skilled clinician and working with people with psychotic spectrum disorders. And so you're very aware of the varied social difficulties that people with psychosis might experience at any given time. So lack of interest in relationships, relationships with high amounts of conflict, social skills, et cetera. Just there are a lot of concerns um, within the psychosis spectrum that are around the social domain. And today I'm gonna to focus mostly on loneliness, but I kind of wanted to start off by talking about the differences between isolation and loneliness as we understand it. So just a very brief outline of my talk today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the prevalence and the consequences of loneliness and psychosis, what we know from the literature. I'm gonna give some assessments in case um, anyone is interested in kind of using quick questionnaires to better assess the social worlds of people with psychosis. I'm gonna talk about a few evidence-based interventions or promising interventions. Um, this is a really new area in research. And so um, unfortunately, um, there aren't a ton of evidence-based interventions in addressing loneliness, but also fortunately, it means it's very ripe for um, experimentation. Um, and then I'll still go through a few brief case studies of my own experience of kind of how I've addressed these social difficulties in clients, uh, particularly young adults who have experienced psychosis. Um, so first off, just loneliness versus isolation. So we typically think of social isolation as the objective absence of social connection. So for example, having a small social network size. Loneliness, on the other hand, is the subjective feeling of one's social needs not being met. Some conceptualize it as an emotional feeling of just feeling disconnected from others. And so in the literature, we see that these um, constructs are modestly correlated, though maybe not as much as you might expect, and they do appear to be independent processes. And maybe that's not surprising to you. You know, you could be in a crowded room and feel very, very lonely. Um, so you're not isolated, but you have high loneliness, or you can be by yourself and feel very connected to other people, which, you know, hopefully throughout the past few years, people have um, maybe felt that through Zoom or other means of just thinking about friends when we're maybe not able to be in a physical proximity with them. Another way we can kind of think of like isolation versus loneliness is like the clinical lens, like how do we treat these constructs differently in our patients? And so if somebody is very isolated, we obviously wanna improve the quantity of their social connections. If somebody's feeling lonely on the other hand, it's more important to prove their perceived um, quality of social connections. With isolation, we definitely have to address changes to social behavior, right? Somebody can't increase their social network size, for example, without addressing behavioral mechanisms. With loneliness, often that's true too. We might address changes to social behavior, but maybe somebody is, you know, has plenty of social network, um, have plenty of friends, family members that they can reach out to, but they still feel very lonely. So it might not be really necessary to change their behavior. On the other hand, you know, when you're very isolated, maybe it's really just about increasing that quantity and we don't really have to address any like emotional difficulties or how somebody feels about relationships. On the other hand, that's the primary uh, treatment goal of addressing loneliness. We really have to address those emotional difficulties. So thinking again to somebody that might have tons of social connections but still feel really very lonely, you can imagine the treatment plan would be much more about like how to address their subjective experiences of their existing relationships without really necessarily addressing specific behaviors. So, you know, this is very simplified, but these are ways we can kind of think of these as independent processes. And obviously, usually when we're addressing loneliness, which is the main focus of my talk today, we want to also address isolation, particularly when we think of people with psychosis spectrum disorders. But it is important to like make sure to understand that these are distinct constructs. So let's just dive right in. So loneliness is pretty prevalent across the psychosis spectrum. It's estimated to be about twice as prevalent compared to the general population. And I should just pause right now, just in case anyone is unclear about this. I'm not including a slide just because it seems very intuitive, but just know there is a ton of research, regardless of your mental health concerns, that loneliness is bad for you, guys. Did you know that? So it's like really bad for our health. It's really bad for us feeling connected with others. It leads to early mortality. It's just bad in general. 
Um, and so particularly people with psychosis, it seems to be prevalent. Um, there was a 2012 Australian national survey where 80% of respondents with psychosis endorsed loneliness with half of them identifying that as their top priority that they wanted to work on in the next year. And there's evidence to suggest that it's prevalent across the lifespan, including in young adults at risk and those experiencing their first episode with some theorizing that loneliness might play this causal role in the development of psychosis. So specifically to the health consequences of loneliness and psychosis, it's positively correlated with positive symptoms and mood symptoms, including depression. Um, it may play a causal role in paranoia. So the idea that loneliness in and of itself might lead to more paranoid styles of thinking versus um, vice versa. Um, it's related to functioning after we control for depression and negative symptoms in people with psychosis. And it's a significant predictor for early mortality over and above smoking and other health conditions that we often um, associate with early mortality. Um, other work has shown that's a predictor for metabolic syndrome, which we all know for people um, with psychosis can be um, a difficult condition that leads to um, lower quality and quantity of life, but it seems to predict metabolic syndrome even when controlling for confounding factors, including medication status. And it's also associated with increases in inflammation. Another reason why we typically think of loneliness as being associated with early mortality and these other health consequences. Treatment need. There's a huge treatment need in addressing loneliness and psychosis. So people with psychosis consistently cite improving relationships as a key treatment goal. There might be misconceptions from providers um, that are a barrier for getting these treatment needs met for some clients. So there might be some assumptions um, from providers that a client is not interested or is unable to form and maintain relationships or the assumption that because relationships in the past have been stressful for this client, they are not enjoyable. And so to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that last point, I'm going to talk about the work that um, Dan and I did related to a systematic review of experience sampling studies that looked at um, daily experiences um, of um, not loneliness per se, but like positive and negative affect experience during social experiences, as well as those experiences when people with schizophrenia reported being alone. And so um, this review is from 2020, so it's not outdated, but since then there have actually been a lot more studies on understanding loneliness in daily life and people with schizophrenia at the time of this review, we didn't review any studies that looked at loneliness specifically. But what we found was that people studied varied things, but um, a consistent theme was that people with schizophrenia reported a preference to be alone when with others compared to the general population. So they wanted to be alone when they reported they were with others more consistently. However, they also reported more positive affect than with, sorry about that typo, more positive affect with others than when alone. And this was very comparable to the positive affect people in the general population felt when with others. And so it's possible based on this evidence that being with others might be stressful or anticipated to be stressful uh, by people with schizophrenia, but that it still feels better to be with others than being alone. And because my background just generally is like an affective motivational um, scientist, um, there's this model that others have developed as well as work from our lab that has contributed to related to what's known as the temporal experience of social pleasure and motivation. And I wanna introduce this model because I think it can be a nice way to think of, it's not specific to loneliness, but it's a way that we generally perceive like our general feelings and motivation for social experiences. So, you know, say we have this great positive social experience like getting coffee with a friend, and we remember that feeling of getting coffee with a friend and how good it felt. And so now we wanna make a social goal to get coffee with that friend again. And so we start anticipating, you know, future social experiences with that friend, which then leads us to the effortful behavior it takes to engage in a social goal. And then that leads to another positive social experience, hopefully, and then the cycle can continue. And then also like during the coffee with a friend, you know, hopefully we're having a pleasant in the moment emotional experience. And so what we know with people with schizophrenia and psychosis in general is that in the moment emotional experience of pleasure during social interactions, as well as other pleasurable experiences, seems to be pretty intact. Again, this is like mostly in the moment, like asking people as they are engaging in a social interaction, it seems like they're having fun. However, these disruptions kind of happen in other parts of the cycle. So we know that people with schizophrenia generally anticipate less pleasure or anticipate more negative affect for social experiences. And we also know there are these disruptions in kind of taking a past positive experience and kind of using the cognitive integration skills so making that into a social goal that they can act on. We know that there are difficulties with motivation, effortful behavior towards those goals. And there are a lot of contributing factors here, negative symptoms, um, defeatist performance beliefs, like not feeling someone's capable of achieving these goals. 
et cetera. And that's a little bit outside of the scope of this talk, but I kind of just wanted to present this model as generally speaking, like our motivation, our feelings around social experiences, there are these difficulties that people with psychosis experience in achieving their social goals and making those goals in the first place. Um, Joanna Badcock, who's actually a consultant on one of our projects and is just an amazing writer, and I'm gonna kind of take a lot of her work um, just whole cloth um, during this talk because she's an amazing thinker related to loneliness and psychosis, recently posited in a great review, very clinically relevant, I highly recommend it, the 2021 um, cited there, this negative feedback loop of self-stigma, loneliness, and psychosis. So while the model I presented earlier is really about social experiences, generally speaking, applied to people with psychosis, um, this one is really specific about the how loneliness affects people with psychosis. And so her model based on evidence suggests that, you know, people feel lonely, that might lead to the development of psychotic symptoms, which then leads to self-stigma, um, feeling kind of, you know, uh, stereotypes or like, you know, just general difficult feelings about having a mental illness in the first place, which then leads to social withdrawal and then leads to more loneliness and the cycle continues. So all this is like, okay, great. We know that loneliness is an issue with people with psychosis. Well, where do we start? Like, we know we have these tools. We know they, are, they have these difficulties. Should we try to address social skills? How do we address social pleasure, motivation, confidence, self-stigma goals? Just a lot of different areas we can kind of like attack at once. And just as an example, um, this is um, from a project that we did in our lab um, where we were doing a open pilot of a mobile app to address social skills and social motivation people with schizophrenia. And in this app, we had people choose a social goal to work on for two months. And I just wanted to show you this data because I think it's an interesting spread. Obviously, this is a small sample of adults with living with schizophrenia, but just the spread of the different goals that people chose. So like making a new friend, improving relationships with an existing friend, maintaining relationship with a family member, or developing a romantic or intimate relationship. So as you can see, people just are really varied about like what social goals they want to work on in any given moment. And so I think it can be helpful to talk to people about exactly what social goal they want to work on but at the same time, I think it's a worthy goal in and of itself to just want to address loneliness, kind of broadly speaking. Maybe that sounds too broad, but I do feel like we might miss that if we only focus on these like very specific types of relationships that people may want to work on. And so moving to like a different direction, where do we start? Well, one place we can we can start possibly is through how we assess loneliness and social experiences. And so maybe you're already familiar with some of these measures, but I just wanna talk about some of the gold standard measures related to loneliness and other measures that might be relevant for your clinical practice and better understanding the social difficulties of people living with psychosis. So the UCI loneliness scale is pretty much the gold standard of assessing loneliness. Um, the original is 20 items. Um, you rate the items from one, never through four often. So it's a trait-based measure. It's high, there's high reliability and validity has been um, tested in multiple populations. It's used, you know, um, gone through multiple iterations to make the language as simple as possible, gold standard psychometrics. And the thing that's really nice about it, it actually never asks someone if they feel lonely, uh, which I think can be in and of itself kind of like a, you know, stigmatizing thing to say that you feel lonely. So it uses other language to get at loneliness. And I really like that it includes both positive and negatively balanced phrases to address these more demand characteristics. And so I'll show you some examples in just a second because there's an eight item version that has been evaluated both adolescents and adults and might be really useful in a more clinical setting. So these are the items. And so um, positively, the more positively valence items are the ones with asterisks. So the idea that I'm an outgoing person or I can find companionship when I want it. Versus these other items that are, you know, I'm lacking companionship, I feel left out, I feel isolation from others. So again, not using the word lonely, but really getting at that construct. And then our lab, we're really interested in momentary experiences of loneliness um, throughout the day. And so um, in consultation with Joanna Badcock, we developed this four item momentary version that has at least one positive valence item and then gets a lot of variability um, so far. I mean, it's still, we're still evaluating it um, at um, loneliness kind of in the moment. Like right now, do you feel that you are tuned with us? Or do you feel like no one really knows you well? Do you feel you can find companionship? Do you feel like people in your life are around you, but not with you? So again, you know, like in a clinical setting, it could be useful to ask questions like these rather than maybe just explicitly saying like, are you lonely? Like getting at it from like other angles. I also think, um, you know, not just because of the model I presented earlier, but I think it is important to understand people's perceptions of their mental illness and like the stigma that might be associated with it because it does really seem to affect uh, people's ability to engage with others. Um, you know, it's 
present of mind. It might not be the most um, minoritized identity that someone has, but it could be. And so I really like the internalized stigma and mental illness um, inventory. It is long. So it might be something that if you're looking at it, you're like, oh, I don't know if we can like do this with everyone. If you find a client that's could, uh, you know, you could benefit from just knowing more about their attitudes about their own mental health condition. Um, it might be helpful to like look at some of these subscales or like take items and be inspired by them. And so there are five subscales getting at these different types of internalized stigma. So the first one is alienation. And here's just an example item of getting someone to agree or disagree of how um, I feel out of place in the world because I have a mental illness. Stereotype endorsement, which is exactly what it sounds like, whether people endorse stereotypes that exist like out in the world about mental illness perceived discrimination, social withdrawal, which might be very relevant for loneliness, so avoiding getting close to people who don't have mental illness to avoid rejection, and then stigma resistance, a more uh, positive um, set of items that really gets at like whether people have this resistance to like internalized stigma, like I can have a good fulfilling life despite having a mental illness. So really getting in a more strengths-based approach, and I really like that this scale includes um, this subscale as well. We got a question, Jasmine, to oh. go back to the eight item screen of loneliness. Um, and to go through a little bit slower uh, what these items are. Um, was that the question to just go slower? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, can we revisit this screen too, uh, the different items here? Yeah, I apologize. I talk fast. <laughs> I have, you know, I'm happy to share this presentation. Um, I try to be explicit with like the references and things like that to where you can find um, all these measures. Um, and you said, so you use the four item subscale in the, the project that you were doing of this? Yeah, we use a subscale in multiple projects actually, yeah. Great, yeah. And I will slow down. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm not really looking at the chat. So if other questions come up, please um, interrupt me. Thank you. Okay. And so I'm not going to show individual items from these other questionnaires, but I did just want to introduce them. Other assessments that might be relevant for you. Maybe you're already familiar with some of them. So social anhedonia or kind of a lack of pleasure during social experiences might be relevant for clients of yours. And so there is, there are these kind of brief scales, the social anhedonia scale, brief and the anticipatory consumatory interpersonal pleasure scale, getting at social anhedonia in different ways. Again, it could be inspiring just types of questions that ask people about the types of pleasure they might experience during social interactions. Um, from our lab, um, we developed the social effort and conscientiousness scale, getting at how much social effort people perceive um, that social experiences take. And so this might be like a nice scale if you want to get a sense of social motivation more than social pleasure. And then again, thinking of like self stigma, but also um, members of our lab have been really interested in the relationship between discrimination experiences and loneliness. So there is the everyday discrimination scale, which again is the kind of a short scale that gets a sense of lifetime discrimination experiences based on various identities. Um, similarly, you know, we are um, doing projects looking at how loneliness might be related to daily experiences of discrimination, not just based on mental health status, but other identities. And so kind of inspired by scales like this, um, we've assessed, we are assessing currently discrimination experiences and um, experience sampling studies, getting a sense of from recent interactions people are having. So not kind of, not just lifetime experiences, but kind of daily experiences to what degree people believe they were treated with less courtesy or respect from others due to race, ethnicity, gender identity, or sexual orientation, physical health condition or disability, and mental health condition or disability. Obviously, these, on, these aren't the only minoritized identities or identities that someone could be discriminated for, but they are the ones that we are like particularly interested in and how they are related to loneliness. And so, you know about kind of the prevalence, the consequences of loneliness and psychosis. We've talked about some assessments that might be helpful. Let's kind of dive into possible interventions that could be useful for clients you might be working with in um, understanding and addressing their loneliness. And I guess before getting into this, I think it's helpful, at least for me to remember, like I think this can be a question that's really easy to not even ask people in clinical work of like, you know, can they find companionship when they want it? Do they feel lonely? Do they feel left out? Um, 
we can be really maybe like hyper focused on other um, things that the client is talking about for like good reasons. But I do think it can be like even I've had the experience of it being very like empowering to be able to like ask people this question and for them to feel like this, they have a space to be able to talk about these things in the first place. So I think even asking about this is like a very powerful intervention in and of itself. Um, going back to Joanna Badcock's model related to the negative feedback loop of self-stigma, loneliness, and psychosis, I thought it might be helpful to kind of think about this model and think about interventions that either are promising or that there is some evidence, maybe not in psychosis or in psychosis um, or in like other populations, such as um, the healthy aging population, which there are a lot of loneliness research going on there as well, um, that could kind of address some of these parts of the cycle. So social withdrawal to loneliness. So cognitive reappraisal could be just like a really good strategy that maybe you're already implementing in your clinical work, kind of changing the way we think to change the way we feel to really address those feelings of loneliness. Promoting positive affect. Um, so taking interventions from positive psychology is a really useful tool. Thinking again, if we think of loneliness as this like subjective distress or subjective negative feeling, like promoting positive affect is a way to address it as well. Just directly addressing stigma for some clients might be enough and getting like a break in this cycle of them not withdrawing as much. Increasing social activity is obviously something that might be very important for a client that's both lonely and isolated, as well as providing opportunities for growth and self-efficacy. So again, thinking of this kind of the relationship between self-stigma and social withdrawal, you know, we want to address the stigma, but then we also want to set our clients up for success, opportunities for them to feel competent, feel like they can actually engage with others if that is a concern that they have. And just going back to the temporal experience of social pleasure and motivation, this is just another model, but I think it also these kind of interventions fit in this model as well. So again, kind of cognitive reappraisal or cognitive integration strategies of like remembering positive um, past social experiences and having that translate to a social goal state if improving social experiences and the frequency of social experiences is a goal of your clients. I think addressing stigma is also really relevant here, again, to get them to want to make social goals in the first place. Uh, promoting positive affect is huge and promoting, you know, the anticipation of future social experiences. Um, increasing social activity, again, kind of moving them towards like feeling motivated, feeling like they want to have social activities towards like the effort behavior towards those activities. And again, opportunities for self-efficacy and success. So maybe starting out with positive psychology interventions. Um, I love these types of interventions. I do a lot of research and clinical work around this um, topic. And um, this is just a very uh, simplified cartoony example of what we know, what we call the affective circumplex. So the idea that our emotional um, experiences kind of fall along these dimensions of like valence, which is the horizontal line of like negative or unpleasant valence versus positive pleasant valence. And then emotional experiences are also based on like how activated or energized we feel. Uh, so kind of low activation, negative emotion might be like sadness, loneliness, right? Kind of we don't feel really energized, but we feel bad. Um, versus a high activation positive experience might be thrilled, animated, euphoric, right? Like a heart's beating fast, we feel really activated, energized, and we're also feeling good. And I have, I have actually shown, you know, I do a lot of work of showing like um, this active, effective circumference for people, particularly those that might have low emotional awareness or um, kind of difficulties distinguishing between these very, these um, different like subsets of emotional experiences. It can be really helpful as like a psychoeducation piece to like show something like this and talking about emotional experiences. And so with positive psychology interventions, um, the whole idea behind positive psychology interventions is this idea that positive emotions serve this function um, to kind of um, broaden our like cognitive flexibility um, and then build social relationships, the broaden and build theory of positive um, emotions. And so this can address like social anhedonia, for example, of just trying to find those opportunities for people to feel social pleasure if they don't, or even think about social relationships in a pleasurable manner. It could also be helpful for people if you're working with clients who have both psychotic symptoms as well as mood um, episodes or mood symptoms. Um, for example, um, there's some work showing for people with um, a history of mania that, you know, mania is often characterized by these like very intense high activation positive emotions like euphoria. Um, and there is research to suggest that these hot, like achieving things that create those emotions, like a job promotion or um, entering a new relationship might be triggers for romantic episodes for some folks. And so what folks do in that case, if they have that insight, um, unfortunately, what they'll do is dampen positive emotional experience, like kind of 
whole cloth, like all positive emotional experiences, they become fearful of them, which if you imagine, especially somebody with bipolar disorder who uh, vacillates between mania and depression, that would possibly be a trigger for a depressive episode if you're going to just try to like diminish or like get rid of any positive emotion in your life. So kind of these positive psychology interventions can be a really useful tool with people who like might be balancing those different mood episodes or just generally have a lack of pleasure in their life generally. Um, all of that being said, I think it's important to think about like how, um, I guess, like accessible some of these emotional experiences are. I don't know about you, but like, you know, feeling euphoric is like not the most accessible emotional experience. I don't know the last time I felt euphoric, like, um, I'll watch my dog, like zoom around the house after he has, he has a poop. And I'm just like, I, I've never felt that excited in my life. Um, and so, you know, clinically, when we think of creating positive emotions in our clients, I think prioritizing those low activation, positive emotions, you know, calmness, serenity, relaxation, and other oriented emotions like kindness, compassion, um, are kind of more accessible emotions to us, even if like we are alone or we don't have a lot of social connections, we can still find ways to think of others. As well as, again, if somebody has a history of mood episodes, particularly mania, those low activation positive emotions aren't associated with um, triggering, triggering manic episodes. And so it's a way to kind of shift maybe someone's thoughts if they do have this like fear of certain positive emotions um, towards the way that they can still feel like fulfilled and like pleasant without it possibly um, being unhealthy for them. And so I already kind of talked about, you know, possibly using the effective circumplex or just, you know, you could give people like a big list of emotion words, um, just to give a little bit of psychoeducation, a little bit of um, more tools for them to like understand, like there are so many emotional words that might be relevant for them in a given moment, but they might be able, they might not be like, able to express that or articulate that um, without like a list. Um, so that could be something useful to do. Um, gratitude is like one of those like more kind of low activation positive emotions is other oriented. You know, gratitude journaling is a great way to think of like what people have been grateful for in past social experiences, what they're grateful for in current social relationships, or just what they're grateful for about people in general, again, to kind of address those more um, cognitive and affective um, difficulties we have when we feel lonely. I think small act of kindness, I think for social behavior is a great way to feel connected with others. And so I like talking about small acts of kindness because maybe this is just me, but like pro-social behavior to me just sometimes it's like a little jargony, but it also seems like, oh, I need to like give all my money away to like a charity. Like it feels like massive and like unattainable versus a small act of kindness is a way to feel connected with others, whether it's just, um, you know, like holding your mother's hand, like when she is feeling down or if somebody is very isolated, like picking up litter is a way to be like, oh, I'm giving back to the world at large um, in my own small free way and can feel like connected with others. Um, and again, with people who might have a history of mania, I think keeping it small and manageable is really crucial. Again, just because um, some people that might be like a warning sign of like trying to give too much money away to somebody else. I think self-compassion is like important for like everybody, all of us, humanity, um, but particularly if you're feeling lonely, you know, giving yourself compassion, um, understanding that like everyone feels lonely at a certain time can kind of, you know, inadvertently make us feel connected to others as well as just being kind to ourselves also addresses like, like self-stigma that we were talking about earlier. Um, reappraisal strategies, again, this idea of like, if we're feeling lonely now, understanding that we don't feel lonely, we won't feel lonely forever, like remembering other times that we felt less lonely. Um, I've used um, the like metaphor of like, am I looking through the world with like gray colored or rose colored glasses? Again, that can be helpful um, if somebody has a history of mania or like they may be looking for like two through two rosy colored glasses. Um, but if somebody's depressed or feeling just lonely, like understanding that they're looking through these gray colored glasses of the world. And like maybe there's a way for us to get at the clear colored glasses way of thinking. Um, a very common refrain you might hear with cognitive reappraisal is like catch it, check it, change it. So like catching an emotion, understanding, acknowledging when it happens, checking to see if it, you know, if there's anything we can do, like um, think differently, um, if it's not serving a purpose for us right now and then changing it. Um, Mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, maybe many of you are already practicing this, but there have been shown to be benefits. Um, I'm sorry, I just try to keep moving my little window here. Um, benefits across mental health conditions. Um, there is some evidence that it helps reduce inflammation to kind of, again, kind of getting at like, with, if we know that loneliness increases inflammation, that like, maybe this is another way that we can kind of like tackle this issue. And it may be particularly beneficial for those when behavior change is not necessary for addressing loneliness. Again, when it's like 
they have plenty of social network, but they still feel lonely, right? It's more kind of trying to change the way they are um, thinking about their uh, particular subjective experience, um, like lowering that stress in different ways if like changing their social behavior isn't super necessary. Loving kindness meditation is a very specific type of mindfulness-based stress reduction that I really like. Um, there was an open trial that showed that it decreased anhedonia and asociality and improved self-acceptance and life satisfaction in people with schizophrenia. I think it was like an eight week loving kindness meditation intervention. Um, it's a type of mindfulness that's very structured. Um, I know, well, I think there's like some mixed evidence with like various types of mindfulness-based stress reduction and like psychosis in particular, depending on people's like trauma history, for example, or just people's general like like of these types of exercises. But loving kindness meditation is like really focused on um, thinking about like compassion that we can show to other people, that we can show the world, as well as what we can show ourselves. And so it kind of promotes that positive emotion that we were talking about earlier, but also like helps us feel connected to others because it reminds us ways that we can like show compassion towards someone else, um, even if they're not present with us. And actually um, one of our students in our lab is working on understanding how this might address um, loneliness compared to other types of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Another thing that people um, are starting to look at more are what's known as shared as subjective experiences. So these are low burden group activities that can promote group cohesion. So creating this like, kind of icebreaker effect of just like, it doesn't take a lot of effort, but maybe like a group of people that don't really know each other very well can suddenly feel like very um, connected with each other in kind of a quick manner. And so this is more for people like, you know, definitely addressing loneliness, but like also addressing people that like might have difficulties finding those social opportunities. And there's this really cool recent study um, at a Zoe Parks team um, looking at choral singing as an intervention for addressing loneliness in people with schizophrenia. So they talked about how choral singing has these social but also non-social benefits. So it kind of reduces stress, it takes cognitive skills. So it promotes kind of practicing cognitive skills and singing. Um, it um, also, you know, is like a physically engaging activity. And so they, again, small open pilot, 17 people with schizophrenia did a weekly one hour choir group for eight weeks. And they found significant reductions in loneliness, depression symptoms, and overall symptoms. And so that's really, I, I just really like this like idea of this intervention. And again, getting people with schizophrenia. So maybe that helped kind of that feel like close to know that everyone had a diagnosis similar to theirs, but also this group wasn't about schizophrenia. This is about something completely different. And they talked about how people really enjoyed it, that there was high um, retention in the group. And so the idea that it helps reduce loneliness through just kind of this shared subjective experiences of people doing one thing is great. And so we can think of other activities like this, right? Like playing a game or like other types of icebreaker activities that might be really helpful um, and low cost, low burden for um, our clients. And so one possibility, and this is work that I've done um, in looking at Skip the Small Talk, which is a Boston-based small business um, that's kind of, it was created by a psychology major who decided not to go to clinical psych grad school and instead develop this business where people come to bars or come to libraries. She's also done corporate events. Um, I think it's like $10 um, over the pandemic. She was doing Zoom events as well, where people come and they, the idea is you come, you meet a stranger and it's like very structured kind of like, intimate interactions you could have. So they have these little cards and like they have questions based on like, I don't know if people remember like the New York Times, 36 questions that lead to love, those kinds of questions to promote intimacy and closeness. Again, kind of skipping the small talk, getting over like, you know, just, oh, how's the weather? Like, did you watch the Patriots game the other night? And getting it more like, oh, talk about like your first major breakup or like, how are you feeling really? And they're very structured and I've been really interested in this business. And so um, early on in the pandemic, when they were doing a Zoom version, we studied it to see if people before they did the group um, over Zoom versus after um, how they felt. And the Zoom version showed a decrease in loneliness and negative affect in this community sample. And the community sample included um, people that had pretty high rates, I would say, of depression symptoms based on the PHQ-8. Um, and we've also kind of looked at, um, we're interested in looking at the in-person effects as well, but this is just like a small project that we did. Um, a similar activity, so not associated with the small business, skip the small talk, but a study that did the 36 questions that lead to love with um, research assistants and people with schizophrenia. Um, they showed that um, doing this activity showed improvements in positive emotion in people with schizophrenia, though they did say it was to a lesser degree compared to those without schizophrenia, but still the idea that like, a person with schizophrenia is coming in, talking to someone they've never met before, doing these questions. Um, they found that like 
that they increased more positive emotion than they were expecting, that they experienced less negative emotion than they were expecting, and that they did show these improvements. And um, talking with Elizabeth Martin, who um, was the lead author on this study, she said that like the data doesn't even really capture for her like how powerful that experience was for some individuals of just, you know, again, being in a conversation with someone feeling really connected that she said that like some people cried because they were so moved by like just this interaction with a stranger around these structured questions. So I think things like that, like again, like kind of getting at how can we promote like vulnerability and intimacy between others um, might be like a nice way and like skip the small talk or other organizations might be trying to do these more shared subjective experiences, especially now that loneliness is a particularly hot topic. <clears throat> So I also want to talk about a group that I was a part of. Um, I was a uh, one of the therapists in the R and RCT related to this treatment narrative enhancement cognitive therapy. I want to make it very clear that this treatment didn't assess loneliness, but I did want to include um, an example of a treatment that's trying to directly address internalized stigma. So this was a 12-week group therapy, manualized, um, that kind of had these three main components, like psychoeducation about mental illness and stigma, cognitive restructuring, and narrative enhancement, or like telling stories and like getting feedback on those stories about people's journey and their mental illness. Um, they found in like these pseudo experimental groups, they did a smaller RCT that I was a part of, um, but overall they found decreases in, in internalized stigma actually based on the ISME, um, the scale I showed you earlier, and increases in hope, self-esteem and quality of life compared to treatment as usual. Um, I really like this uh, manualized treatment. And I think just like the ideas behind it, I think are really great. I would say that if we did if we had measured loneliness, I, it would be interesting to see if we saw decreases in our group. And just to be very explicit, at least the groups that I was part of as a therapist, um, they specifically sought out people with serious mental illness, kind of um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, um, um, pulled people who had high levels of internalized stigma to begin with. So this isn't just kind of like getting anybody with a serious mental illness. They specifically recruited for people who met a specific threshold for having a high internalized stigma. Um, and so the fact that they did that and then they still saw these decreases in people that had pretty high internalized stigma, I think is pretty incredible. Um, and just to kind of go through more of the components of this treatment, um, like I said, like in the first few weeks are starting out with psychoeducation. So talking about stigma versus self-stigma, which I think can be really powerful for people. I think people tend to blame themselves for like the thoughts they have related to their mental illness, but we all know that that exists in the media, it exists in the air we breathe. Um, so un having people understand the stigma associated with mental illness existed far before they were ever diagnosed with a mental illness. And the idea that like the self stigma isn't their fault, they're experiencing this. Um, we also would go through myths about mental illness, like uh, people with mental illness are violent, uh, people with mental illness will never recover. Um, and then um, through psychoeducation, I think a big question that a lot of clients have are is this advantages versus disadvantages of self disclosure. And so within this group, it's not like there's a right answer, but we ex spend time exploring with people like whether they think that would be helpful or unhelpful in their life and in what ways, or who you know positive and negative experiences they've had with self disclosure. And then the next chunk of the group is really about cognitive restructuring, which maybe many of you are familiar with. So going through the CBT triangle, the idea that thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all connected, um, talking about how stigma is associated with our thoughts and our feelings. So, you know, going through like the cognitive distortions, like black and white thinking, but like how that might be very specific to people's internalized stigma. And then going through, you know, alternative ways of thinking. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to remember the exact phrases that we would use, like be a scientist, right? Like going through evidence for and against the thoughts versus um, like uh, think of a friend, like what would a friend tell you, you know, or what would you tell a friend if they were having this thought? Um, one question we've gotten, have any of these looked at different socioeconomic groups from any of the interventions? Any of the interventions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, I know, well, next that I'm talking about, I know that they did it in, um, so like this is part of when I was working at a partial hospital program, um, there was mostly um, Medicaid Medicare clients um, to do the next group. Um, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head. I, I mean, I know work with positive psychology interventions, a lot of it is like thinking about like free and accessible interventions. So I'm not quite sure off the top of my head whether people have like exactly looked at um how socioeconomic sets might influence like the uh, efficacy of those types of interventions but i think 
a lot of people try to focus on things that can be free or easily accessible regardless of someone's socioeconomic status. And another question of uh, how to find uh, NECT practitioners. Uh, this is from someone in Connecticut. How to find NECT? Uh, NECT, yes. So um, how oh, to get NECT yeah. providers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, this is kind of a, an experimental treatment that was developed to just try to see, like, I think it's still pretty novel. Um, Phil Yanos is the one um, who's at John Jay in New York, um, who developed this. I think emailing him, um, I think he'd be happy to share like the manual. Like obviously there was a training involved. I don't know if it's kind of where they're at with dissemination. Um, I really wanted just to share it because I do think within the manual, there are these kind of principles that like one learns through like CBT or one learns through like other types of therapy that I think is just like a nice model that one could follow. Um, but I don't know if like, I don't think there was any like open training or like certification necessarily regarding this treatment. Great, thank you. And I see uh, uh, you have all of your um, uh, citations here, but uh, a question about whether those are all available at the end. I believe they are, um, but that's great to have the, the name of the person doing that. Yeah, I did not include a super thorough reference list at the end, but I can to disseminate. I kind of tried to just have these at the bottom, but like I did not get around to doing that. I'm sorry, but I can definitely yeah, do no. that. We can we can definitely share that with folks after. Yes, perfect. Um, and then um, just the last section of NECT is like these, this narrative enhancement part where people write stories, they get feedback on their stories. And again, this could be something that you could do in your clinical practice, but um, these are just some examples that we would have like stories of coping with illness. Um, so just getting a sense from people like how you decided whether you have a mental illness or not, and if so, what is it? A time when you change your mind about what your mental illness is and what caused that. Um, you know, kind of getting a sense of like how their illness influenced their life and how they influenced their illness, something they used to do well before and now find it difficult or something they hope will happen in their life. And so we would start with these stories of just kind of like getting a sense of what people feel about their mental illness, but we would always end the group with like stories of like hope and recovery, like things like people feel um, they still maintain these strengths around these stories. So again, like just something you might want to incorporate. It's not something like I, I incorporate a ton, but like I love being part of like this experimental group. Like it was really powerful and like really interesting. And like depending on a client's, you know, own interest in writing and things like that, it could have, um, you know, different buy-ins with different people. <clears throat> and I just wanted to put a little note here on social skills training. So just like particularly addressing social skills in uh, people with psychosis. Um, I think it's just unclear how much directly addressing social skills training, which is important for a lot of other um, types of functioning, but like whether or not it really gets at loneliness. So in the studies that assess kind of the outcomes of social skills training, loneliness is often not really assessed. When it is, improvements in social skills seem to be unrelated to a reduction in loneliness, which like kind of makes sense, right? Like it's this idea that of course, like social skills can help with like occupational functioning or like in engaging with others, but it could be difficult to practice these skills if opportunities are really rare. Like if somebody is really, really isolated, um, not working, um, depending on the type of client you're working with, it just might not be the most useful thing to address. At the same time, I think it is really helpful in improving other aspects of functioning um, that may never really address them. So like working on social skills training with like a college student or with somebody trying to find a job is like really helpful because we know that if somebody gets into school or has a job that like their social functioning generally means that it'll improve because they're just seeing people more frequently. Um, I'm going to talk when I get into my case studies about doing social skills training with a particular individual, because again, I think it's a case by case basis of like how you use it and whether it's a need of someone in terms of like why they are feeling lonely. And so just getting into those case studies a little bit, I'm actually going to present two. Um, funnily enough, um, I was trying to think of like cases that were like really different to kind of show different skills that could be implemented. And this is actually my first, yeah, it was my first individual case with um, a young adult with psychosis. And then this is my most recent case, which is just like a funny little like bookending thing. Um, 
And so I'm first going to talk about Chris. And so Chris was 23 years old when I was working with him, white male, schizophrenia diagnosis. He was an English major and a senior in college. So he was a full-time student when I was working with him. Um, he had his first hospitalization after his first year of college, which actually was at a different school and then he transferred. Um, his main concern, like he was medicated, his positive symptoms were really under control. It was really addressing kind of his significant negative symptoms. And so a lot of our work was around his social life. So, you know, this thing I'll never forget that he said to me is, I want to be motivated to be motivated to be social. Like he had such low motivation. His social skills were below average. Uh, he had very blunted affect, but it was clear that he felt like he was missing out on something, especially, you know, living on campus, being part of a college community and knowing that like when he entered the world, he was going to have to continue to be social. And he just felt like something was lacking. So I ended up working with him for about eight months in weekly outpatient therapy setting. Alternatively, we have Amanda. So Amanda was a 24-year-old Philippine female. Um, she has schizoaffective disorder, mania subtype, but also other previous diagnoses, so kind of complicated. So she had previously been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder as well as borderline personality disorder. In my time working with her, there were some borderline personality disorder traits that came up. Um, she graduated, she was super high functioning. Um, so I do also wanna have a caveat that both of these um, individuals I'm talking about are um, fairly high functioning in certain ways. So like she was a previous college graduate, um, she was considering an engineering um, degree in grad school. Um, she had lived in other places, including the Philippines and the UK in the past. And this is her first time in the USA when I was working with her. Basically what happened is she came to go to grad school and then was hospitalized for psychosis for the first time. Um, it's unlikely that this was her first psychotic episode. It seems like in the past there were mania episodes that had psychotic symptoms that weren't really addressed or recognized at the time. Um, she'd been hospitalized, I think, once before for, um, like, self, uh, uh, sorry, um, for homicide ideation against a family member. Um, and so, but this was the first kind of, like, hospitalization for psychosis. It was also the first time she had a psychosis diagnosis um, and had, like, kind of heard that applied to herself. And so when I was first seeing her, she was getting out of inpatient and she, you know, clearly she was able to maintain it, but she had varied hallucinations, um, had delusions about the past that she was still like holding on to pretty strongly and was overall just like in a very stressful place. Um, she'd also had a significant experience of racial discrimination and trauma. So one of the reasons she came um, across like my referral desk is because she wanted an Asian American therapist. Um, she had kind of when she was living abroad, she definitely had these internalized um, racist ideas of being an Asian female, um, had been hypersexualized as a child, had multiple instances of both sexual and physical trauma um, in the past. And then also like when she had um, lived in the UK experienced just like a lot of racial discrimination, microaggressions about um, her race and ethnicity kind of for the first time in a very like unique way where she was a minority for the first time. Um, and so kind of was coming with like a lot of that history as well. Um, her goal was not really social at all in treatment. So like was to get stabilized and she wanted to get past her traumas and catch up with her peers. She felt like she was really behind. Um, she was trying to figure out whether she wanted to still go to grad school or not, but um, was just having a really difficult time. And at the same time, she, um, I think, was really pleased with um, having a psychotic diagnosis for the first time. It felt like it really fit with her versus the other diagnosis that she said had never really fit with her. Um, and talking with her, it seemed like she had had some clinical as well as clinical psychotic experiences kind of throughout her life. So I don't want to talk about her as like a first episode case because I do think there were multiple episodes of psychosis in the past that just were unrecognized. But um, I was the first person that worked with her with kind of a background and like addressing psychosis. And so um, I worked with her uh, very briefly, so only for about three months, twice a week in outpatient um, telehealth. And so just like kind of comparing Chris and Amanda. So were their treatment goals related to social functioning or loneliness? Chris, big yes. That was the main thing he wanted to work on. Amanda, not at all. Would they say they felt lonely if you asked them? Chris absolutely would. I mean, that was the main thing. He just knew that he was missing out on some like important social experiences in college. He definitely felt lonely. Amanda would probably say not. It's not something that I ever explicitly, well, I did, I think, explicitly ask her about it. And she kind of would always brush it off. Um, at the same time, like throughout my work with her, she was living in different like residential facilities. And I think loneliness um, for her even if she wouldn't say that she felt lonely, her behavior has indicated that she was feeling um, dysregulated from not having kind of a core social 
group any longer. So like what would happen is she would kind of like rely on very specific um, case managers during that time in inappropriate manners, um, just like really crossing boundaries in a way that made it seem like she just really needed somebody else to help regulate her in a way that she wasn't getting. Would they say that they can find companionship when they want it? They would both say no. And that's something that actually Amanda would talk about, which is like the idea that she wanted eventually to like get married, have kids, um, but like wasn't sure if she would be able to um, based on her diagnosis, was like constantly wanted reassurance of whether she would ever get better, um, while also kind of like ignoring sometimes, like this kind of like interesting thing where she would like want reassurance about whether she would ever get better, but also like, talk about how she needed to just catch up with her peers and she was taking too long um, in her treatments. Um, and then, like I said before, like she had had previous traumas related to like romantic relationships. So I think it was also something that she wanted, but she just like wasn't sure how it would go. She kind of didn't trust her judgment in other um, romantic partners. And then their main social difficulties also differed a lot. So um, like I said before, like Chris's positive symptoms were pretty managed. And so like, it was really like this low motivation and some below average social skills versus Amanda. I would say her social skills also were like possibly below average, but like less so. Like she didn't really have blunted affect, which I think is something really salient to some folks. Um, but she was distrustful of others based on these past traumas and racial discrimination. She really didn't like being in the United States. Um, based on its like similarity she felt to the UK. And then like also this like kind of splitting behavior where like she would idealize people like case managers or previous relationships one moment and then like talk about how traumatic and terrible they were the next moment. So my treatment plan of progress with Chris. So I know I said before like research is really mixed and like social skills addressing loneliness, but with Chris, like it was something we practiced a ton because mostly like he could do it pretty well. It was cognitively demanding for him, but he also had ample opportunities to practice, right? So like it doesn't, social skills practice doesn't really address loneliness if you don't have anyone to like practice it with. But he was living in a house um, <clears throat> on campus with like multiple people. He was on a vibrant campus community. He was going to classes. Like he doesn't really, he didn't really engage in too many clubs, but like he had so many opportunities to practice his social skills. And also like, I think it really improved his own feelings of self-efficacy because again, we would like do these role plays. I would bring in other um, trainees to do role plays with him. Also like give him like the confidence boost that he was able to like carry on a conversation with someone that he didn't know, that he was able to like work on expressing emotions a little bit more deeply. And so more effectively, um, and so it really gave him like boosts and self-confidence to be able to practice these skills and be successful at them, uh, which he was. And then we would also do some positive psychology related interventions. So we would like kind of monitor pleasurable versus non-pleasurable both social interactions, but also activities. I think it was just hard for him to know what he liked doing. And so we would kind of like go through like his activities from a past week and talk about like what he found pleasurable, what he didn't, um, what he had found pleasurable in the past before his illness set in and like maybe he would try those activities again. Um, going to baseball games, for example, um, and then also reappraisal strategies related to um, like him discussing previous social interactions and like, you know, saying that like it wasn't really worth the effort or that he didn't really have fun. But then like the more we talked about it, you know, he would also say that he felt like they ended a little quickly. So like just trying to really get at like, OK, maybe your initial instinct is thinking that maybe that experience wasn't worth the effort, but like what parts of it were enjoyable for you? And then we also spent a lot of time talking about how motivation is an action, not a feeling. And so like, rather than him waiting around to feel motivated and then to go ask somebody to like go to a baseball game, for example, to just do it and that the motivation would come through practice was also like a really important um, principle we practiced. And so my progress with him is that he definitely engaged with roommates more. And I remember this, I was so proud of him. Like he asked like a classmate, somebody he didn't even really know that well to a baseball game. And they like, they went and they like had a great time. And then they like, you know, hung out a few more times after that. It wasn't like a lifelong friendship, but like where he was when I first started working with him, like that was a massive, um, just massive improvement. For him. And so at termination, um, we, uh, termination was just because he was moving back home and graduating. And so he did end up uh, working part-time, but he like moved back home with his parents at the time. We always have these should haves, right? These like things that we reflect back and it's like, I oh, should have spent more time working with him on this. Um, the main thing was the experience I wish I had explored his like romantic interests and sexual orientation more. And so something that comes up, I think a lot in asking people about like various um, social goals is like if they're interested in romantic relationships or not. And then when they say no, it could be for many reasons, right? 
And so, you know, I've worked with clients who have like initially said they no, they don't want to work with them at all. And then over time, it comes out that it's not that they don't want them. It's that they feel worthless and they feel like no one would ever love them. Right. Like that's something that can happen a lot with people or, oh, it's just not possible because of the stigma that they have related to them. It's all diagnosis. And so Chris never showed an interest in talking about romantic relationships or talking about dating. I remember explicitly asking him about it and just like, didn't really seem like it was something of interest to him. And I remember talking to my supervisor and us thinking like, you know, the way that he had talked about them, we weren't quite sure if he fit into those other molds, but like, it's possible that he like was asexual. Um, something that we kind of thought about for a while. We had this working hypothesis and we just never really dove super deeply with him about it. And so something that I wish we would have done. Treatment plan and progress for Amanda. And so with Amanda, again, this is like a shorter, more intense kind of treatment period. Um, she was coming out of inpatient, um, kind of dealing with a psychotic diagnosis for the first time. We spent a lot of time just like acknowledging and validating her past racial discrimination. She never really said that she felt invalidated from others, but she would just constantly kind of just talk about these instances of her feeling like hypersexualized or, um, you know, discriminating against in these small ways by like past um, white relationships with like specifically like white European men. Um, and I think she just really wanted validation from another Asian female that like, yeah, that does sound like that was ha what was happening. It's really uncomfortable when that happens. It's unclear, like, because we'll never know if that's exactly what was going on. Um, so she, I think, just needed a lot of validation that that wasn't like all in her head. I think also dealing with a psychotic diagnosis, she really didn't trust her judgment as much as she used to, like now that she had that label. And so I think it was helpful for her to just kind of talk through these experiences of whether or not she'd be like, was I being paranoid? Or do you feel like that was something uncomfortable? You know, I think she really appreciated just like somebody like being able to try to wade those waters with her. Um, I did a lot of psychoeducation with her on just psychosis in general. Um, again, this is the first time she kind of heard that. She like was very smart would like research it all the time, would come to me with like clinical jargon ready to talk about it. But I still think it was like really helpful for her to hear from somebody who had worked with other individuals with psychosis, kind of like what to expect. Um, did a lot of like addressing stigma as I talked about before, like the idea that sometimes she would feel like she's never going to get better, um, that she would feel like she would like slide back if like her symptoms got worse one day. Um, so just trying to do a lot of like having her kind of be aware that like progress isn't like a straight line. We did try mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques because she would just get very activated in session um, and kind of have these like kind of urges for self-harm when she was just feeling like a lot of intense and pleasant feelings. Um, we tried progressive muscle relaxation once and she really hated it. She said it reminded her of a past trauma. And so like, it's not something that we did again. Um, we never got to love and kindness meditation, unfortunately, but we did do a few um, leaves on a stream exercises. So in case you're unfamiliar, this is like a um, imaginal mindfulness exercise where you like have somebody go to like a quiet, lovely stream that could be somewhere from their memory or somewhere not. And then like imagining the stream and then like watching leaves fall on the stream, leaving the mind's eye, but then they start placing their thoughts on the stream. And so this was one way we were trying to get at like her kind of separating herself from her thoughts. Um, and she did that a few times and I think generally like liked it and it was a way to kind of like feel calm and feel like when she was having self-harm thoughts that it wasn't that she wanted to harm herself but that she was having the thoughts of wanting to harm herself. Um, so she found that helpful. And then we started but didn't get too deep dive into kind of self-compassion skills. So she, one way that we did that is that kind of each day she would um, journal something that she was like proud of accomplishing, like whether it was like getting out of bed or taking her medication or applying to a job or um, calling a friend, something that she could like show that like, oh, like I am making progress. I am moving forward. I'm not just like sitting still. And then eventually we would also include like watching TV for 30 minutes because she would kind of feel like she needed to constantly be going, 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 that she couldn't relax while she was like in residential care. <clears throat> so overall, like she, we saw like a very significant symptom reduction of her hallucinations, as well as her clarity on like, she actually started seeing kind of beliefs she'd had in the past as delusional content, which was also a big deal. Um, we worked on clarity on her life values. So she decided that she didn't want to go to grad school. Um, and then we started doing some work acknowledging just like the interpersonal difficulties that she had had both that they weren't her fault, um, especially the traumatic ones, but also that like, she did have some interpersonal, um, style, um, she has some interpersonal behaviors that like, I think were impairing um, for maintaining intimacy with people. So termination, uh, we mostly terminated because she's entering a DBT focused program um, and that her psychotic symptoms had gotten so much better that like my 
uh, care like just wasn't the most integral for her at that stage. Um, and then she also had decided that she's probably not going to stay in the USA long term. And then the should haves again, like thinking again about like the loneliness and everything, the shared subjective experiences. This came out so late in treatment. I was I was bummed that I didn't ask about it sooner. But like she had done in college musical theater, and she talked about how much she loved it. And I was like, oh man, like if only she, I had like, you know, we had talked about that sooner, we could have thought of like groups she could have attended or ways for her to engage with others. And this like thing that she was really passionate about, but so much of our talk was more about like these other things that just didn't come up. So I wish we would have like carved out some more time to talk about that. And so I kind of want to like end with these um, three points from like Joanna Badcock's recent review that I really like of like addressing loneliness and psychosis, like her kind of like clinical take home messages. That like the idea that there may be a benefit in using both direct and indirect measures for loneliness. So again, talking about like not just asking people, point blank, are you lonely? But like, oh, can you find companionship when you want it? Do you feel like in tune with others types of questions? Um, interventions may be more successful if they, if they incorporate strategies to reduce stigma. And that practitioners should regularly reflect on how their attitudes and behaviors may be influencing their practice. Again, going back to kind of what I was saying earlier about just some literature showing that like we sometimes we just forget to ask about this and we think it's not a priority, or we might have these our own biases related to like our clients and their ability to maintain our form. So with that, I um, just want to thank like my lab members, including our principal investigator Dan Fulford. And do a quick plug on some of our current research studies. If you are interested in learning more, or if you have clients that you think would be a good fit for these studies, we're doing a bunch of different studies on understanding how loneliness and social connection fluctuate in daily life. We're doing a big study in partnership with Daphne Holt and MGH on the relationship between loneliness, immune function, brain activity, and physical health in people with serious mental illness. We're interested in understanding the relationship between loneliness and discrimination experiences across studies. And then um, soon we'll be starting a, a study looking at the efficacy of brief mindfulness interventions to reduce loneliness. And so we're actively recruiting for people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or bipolar disorder. Um, some of our studies are listed on the MapNet research website, little blurbs, and then just amplab at bu.edu is where you can reach our lab coordinators um, or me. Um, happy to put you in touch. So uh, that's my email and um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I did, uh, I put a link to our research page, which has some of those uh, posts as well. Um, so it, uh, people can uh, start putting uh, questions in the chat if they have them. Uh, one point that just came up for me that I wanted to uh, revisit or ask about was the one about the client who you thought might be uh, asexual. Um, that's something that I remember talking about um, with our team, even with the social functioning scale, include some sort of romantic relationship as a kind of a requirement for being well functioning socially. Um, so how is it something that you've uh, thought about or you know talked with people about when doing this kind of work? Great question. I mean, it's definitely something I don't want to pretend to be an expert on like that uh, population at all. Um, but it is something that I've been trying to incorporate more in my practice. Um, so I think just explicitly asking people how they identify in their sexual orientation, like their intake is something that I always do is like verbally. And I've gotten people um, to describe themselves in ways that, like I wouldn't necessarily, I think, get at like, you know, later on in discussions. So like, this is not a client with psychosis, but like this came up with a client that I was doing an intake with who um, the woman married to a man. And like, when I asked about her sexual orientation, like talked about being um, a great ace, which was not a phrase I had heard before. And so like, she talked to me a little bit about it, but this idea that she like considered herself kind of like in the gray area of asexuality. So she would have physical intimacy, she would have sex with her husband, but it was not something that she particularly enjoyed. And she saw it more as like a um, function of like maintaining intimacy with um, her husband. So like, that's how she identified. And I, you know, did a little bit of more research afterwards. And so I think just explicitly asking how people identify. The thing that I remember about my client, Chris, was I think he said he didn't know. And I think that just really struck with me, stuck with me, where it's like, maybe he doesn't know because he's not interested in it. Maybe he doesn't know because he just doesn't know, you know, he's still a young adult. Um, but I think, yeah, not wanting to, it's like both, right? You don't want to assume that somebody um, should have um, an interest in like sexual or romantic partnerships. And at the same time, clinically, I've had the experience of like somebody being like, I'm just not interested in romance and me 
thinking to myself that maybe they were on the asexuality spectrum. And then later on, it came out through our therapeutic alliance where it's just like, well, it's that's just not for me, right? Like I'm worthless. Like I'll never be able to find love. So like it's just off the table. Like you, it's just like a hard balance, I think, of exploring that with people. But like, I would say like if somebody explicitly says their orientation is like some form of asexuality, you know, I would want to trust that um, at face value, which is not something that, you know, clients later on, it comes out that there might be other issues going on have like described themselves as. Thank you. Um, another uh, discussion that um, I saw a little bit before was on kind of the intersection of these um, more emotional type skills and social skills training. Um, so I was interested in that last point about how, um, you know, social skills training, while not directly approaching loneliness, um, in a lot of ways can indirectly uh, affect it. So can you talk more about that? Yeah, I think it's just, I mean, I think it's complicated. So like, I think I agree with like people that say that the evidence doesn't really support the idea of social skills training being a direct influence on loneliness. At the same time, it is something that it's like if somebody's social skills are so impoverished, that is the main barrier of them interacting with others, then like kind of intuitively for me, addressing those skills, getting them out into the world and feeling confidence and being able to interact with others is going to help it, address their subjective experience of loneliness. I think I think it's more just like, we don't wanna confuse those things, right? Like if somebody's, if we're addressing social skills, we don't wanna automatically assume that that is addressing their subjective feeling of connection with others. It's more like, and like thinking about like my client, Chris, it was like clearly something that I think was really helpful and useful for him. And also it wasn't the only thing we did. I wasn't doing a social skills protocol. He had done actually that in the past and found it like just okay. It was like, incorporating social skills training protocol pieces like role plays like I remember a role play we did of like videotaping him and being like okay I want you to be the most effusive expressive you can be and talking about something you're excited about and he did it and like it took a lot of effort but it was like oh like you have this ability to like express yourself and express what you're excited about it just takes a little bit more taking those pieces and then being able to implement in ways that like address like what he actually cared about in social relationship, ways to get him feeling more connected and engaged with others. Great. And we have a question. So from Charles in the chat. Um, so he says, I've noticed a lot of organizations here who might also work with families in addition to individuals. Um, so do you know of any resources or have recommendations for supporters of people with psychosis to recognize and support when they're dealing with loneliness? Mm. That's tricky. I don't off the top of my head. Um, I think we know that like intrusiveness from family members um, can be unhelpful, right? Or like taking too much ownership over um, a family member or a child's like emotional, mental health well being is leads to like consequences for both the child and the family member, like in their mental health. Um, that's a great question. I'll have to do some digging. I don't have any like resources off the top of my head. I mean, I think providing um, opportunities for success is something that I think a lot about. I think addressing a family member's own stigma and their own biases they might have about their family member um, are things that I think, you know, would be beneficial, um, you know, whether a family member thinks that somebody like you know, maybe it's like, oh, well, we'll never be able to make friends, right? Like addressing those things. And at the same time, not going overboard, like not going to the extreme end of being like, well, I need to like plan my family member social calendar from now on. Um, I think, you know, talking with a lot of people, like I'm thinking a lot about like the um, open trial we did where like a lot of people had the social goal of like wanting to improve or maintain relationships with family members. Um, and like, you know, this was, you know, a study, it wasn't a qualitative study. So like, I can't really speak to like all those reasons why, but I think that could also be really helpful. Like just understanding like, what about the family relationship? You know, we know the family relationships um, between um, people with and without schizophrenia can be pretty froth. There can be a lot of dysfunction there. Um, I didn't present this work, but I uh, did an experience sampling study looking at like the relationship between positive and negative affect in um, different qualities of social relationships with people with schizophrenia. And we found that um, I believe the higher the intimacy people reported, the more negative affect they reported in those relationships, uh, which 
I don't think it's like that surprising, just, you know, intimate relationships often have more conflict because they're more intimate. Um, and so I think supporting somebody with um, a family member with uh, schizophrenia or psychotic episode, just like keeping that in mind that like your support in different ways isn't gonna like maybe fix the loneliness issue, but like just asking the person like what would be helpful? Like what could I do to help support you and like whatever social goals um, you might have. But I, I'll definitely do a little digging to see what there might be out, what might be out there for um, family members. Right. I know we have some other uh, family folks on the the call too. So if any of you have thoughts, but uh, I mean, it I'd just sounds that. like that uh, is a part of you know the relationship with family members is a significant, important social relationship for a lot of people that can uh, be particularly affected. But great. Um, other questions. So uh, Lucy asked if you have any experience working with clients who cancel on sessions uh, often with providers and how to maintain those regular uh, meetings with those folks. Yeah, that's like such a problem, right? Um, yeah, I mean, this is not specific maybe to loneliness, but it is one of those things of just like, getting a sense of like what the person's possibly avoiding or being unsatisfied with, right? Like understanding, I mean, like, I'm not trying to be like be blase here, but like, it's a tiny reason why doing positive psychology interventions is kind of fun because it's like enjoyable for the person. Like I find myself like in the past, if I have a client that I think is canceling a lot of me because we're talking about really difficult things and have like, I'm, you know, kind of challenging or pushing them to try difficult things. Like usually we'll spend the next session that they're able to come back with talking through that a little bit, but then like kind of, I try to switch gears a little bit and be like, it seems like things have been kind of tricky and hard, you know, I think incorporating more positive emotion in your life might be something else helpful would you feel like there's something we could like work on together related to that so like again like it's one of the nice things about positive psychology interviews versus like exposure it's like just like, so hard because it's like so uncomfortable and unpleasant um but it's still trying to get at these like mechanisms that like are really important and like addressing emotion and generally I think people like even talking like I've had clients that like appreciate hearing about like there's research on this or there's research on like positive emotions this idea that it gives some kind of um credence or like I don't know seriousness to this thing that maybe they think is too fluffy um so I don't know if that's helpful but yeah that's just like a hard thing generally to deal with as a client a clinician Great. Yeah. And um, Abby, I see you're, you're on video, but I can read out your uh, question in the chat too. Um, so Abby asked, um, has loving kindness meditation been shown to be effective in cases where social anhedonia seems to be caused more by grieving a loss of mania rather than emotional restriction to avoid mania? That's a great question. I don't know about um, the evidence behind that, um, though I do, I appreciate that context of that, like, you know, uh, promoting positive feelings and compassion. It shouldn't just be like avoiding something quote unquote bad, right? It could just be like improving positive feelings because you are grieving the loss of like the positive feelings you felt towards mania. Um, <clears throat> I was mostly speaking from my own experiences of like uh, helping to develop a group specifically for people that like had issues related to like the dampening emotion regulation strategy I talked about before, the idea of like people with bipolar disorder <coughs> who avoid positive experiences to too great of an extent because of like a fear of mania. Um, I think it could definitely apply to people that are grieving that loss um, that like miss how good that felt and finding like other outlets for positive emotions for sure. I think that that I, I, could be helpful. Um, I didn't mean to imply that it was should only be used to like restrict or avoid um, a certain feeling or not feeling um, mental health condition. I mostly am just saying that because something we talk about with people is like maybe it's not an emotion. Um, it's like a cluster of symptoms that like euphoria or irritability is associated with it. But I think that's an important distinction to make with some people that like, oh, it's like not a feeling, it's not an emotion. It's like something else entirely. And then uh, one more question uh, from Jamie. So about meditation and psychosis. Um, so it, <laughs> uh, she says, I found some info that it could be troublesome for some regarding going inside. Um, so how's that looked in the work that you've done? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is a lot of mixed evidence of the efficacy of some uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques for people with psychosis and people with significant complex trauma, for sure. Um, 
I think it's like a case by case basis. And generally speaking, when I do this type of work with um, clients, I do really structured exercises and I allow them to stop at any point. So if the client Amanda that I talked about that I tried to do a progressive muscle relaxation, she stopped kind of after like two minutes and I didn't want to push it because it was just like, clearly she was in distress about it. Um, I mean, and this, this, this isn't unique to psychosis. I've had other clients. Um, I remember having a trans client that like we tried to do mindfulness and he immediately was like, this is giving too much attention to my breath and my chest and I'm feeling body dysmorphia and I don't want to do it anymore. I was like, okay, like that makes total sense. I don't want to cause you that stress, right? Like, it's not like I want to push anything that's going to cause somebody stress for any reason or that it might be contraindicated based on where they are um, in their health. And so and the thing I like about loving kindness meditation, like I said, is like I would just pull up a recording or a script and do it. And it's very, very structured. Um, I think it takes them outside of their body, right? Because it's not focused on bodily sensations. There's a little bit in most protocols that like you focus on the breath just to kind of stabilize someone. But it's very like, it's not just about their body, which might be very disorienting for some folks. It's about like, okay, thinking about a very specific person. Um, similar to Leaves on a Stream, which is also very um, structured and organized around like imagery I have had clients that are just like I can't imagine this right like not again regardless of psychosis like sometimes people just don't have a very like crisp and clear mind's eye to imagine this extreme and like leaves falling on it's a kind of a complicated cognitive process I have definitely had uh, clients with psychosis that have been able to do it and like liked it but I've had clients that are just like I I don't know what you're supposed to ask you're asking me to do um so I think with mindfulness based stress reduction it really depends on the individual and um I think just gently seeing what people might be interested in what like doesn't cause significant distress um there are a lot of different exercises but I would say generally speaking with psychosis spectrum clients I don't do more um diffuse like body scans oh yeah I see the comment too about act for psychosis or Guffrey does a good job talking through this issue definitely it's really complicated with people with psychosis trauma and other types of stress yeah thank you charles um just a quick note for participants i just sent a post event survey in the chat and i'll send one out via email after the event so if you all could just take a few minutes to complete that it will help us put on more events in the future and then you guys had a last slide too right i wanted to show that Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so this is uh, from the um, MHTDC. So definitely recommend you guys uh, check out some of the other talks that they've done. Um, we do have time for one more question. Uh, if uh, anybody has a, a final thought. Um, I'll say is my final thought. Uh, this is, uh, I feel like there is a, a lot that I learned through this, especially I appreciate the the case discussions and how different but also similar um, some of those aspects were. Um, so thank you so much for putting all of this together. Uh, I really got a lot out of it. Thank and, you again for the invite. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, so we can uh, give everyone five minutes back um, and appreciate uh, all of you coming today. Thank you, everyone.